good afternoon, and uh, and it's very ni very nice to be to be here. Uh, and of course, it's nice to be with uh, with the scientists in the field, um, so I can uh, discuss a little bit more detail than we than we did this morning uh, at, or at the uh, at the ceremony. Um, so I I thought that today um, there's just a few things I want to uh, tell you about that are moving ahead, um, and and I'll explain why it is I think it's important to try to um, make these kinds of detailed measurements uh, the way that I'm hoping we, we get to do. Um, and uh, I, I thought I might just begin, I'm assuming that most people in the audience here um, know about what, this, what the field is, but I figure I le should at least do the usual like five minute start um, just to bring everybody in who may, if there are a few people here who have, haven't seen these kinds of measurements before, um, just to, to remind everybody what, what it is that we're talking about. So uh, the basic idea is that um, the, the issues of the expansion of the universe um, can be studied by looking at the history of the expansion over time. So this is the average distance between galaxies as a function of time. And at the time when we began all this work, uh, many of us uh, might, you know, we still remember, we thought we were going to be uh, either in a universe that was decelerating and going to expand forever or one that would decelerate and then eventually collapse. And the technique that I'll be uh, focusing on to start with and that we actually um, used to get the measurement was the technique of using these uh, supernova uh, exploding stars where the relative brightness tells you how far back in time, uh, how, how far away you're looking and how far back in time, therefore. And their redshift tells you how much the universe has expanded since that time of each supernova. So each dot that you can plot would be a different supernova and each one would, would tell you how much the universe has expanded as a function of time uh, from, from that particular explosion. Um, the, obviously the results uh, missed all these lines and they ended up uh, telling us that we live in a different kind of universe, um, one that was apparently first decelerating and then began accelerating uh, for the last half of its, of its life, um, last you know, seven billion years. And of course this was the uh, big surprise that was um, seen by two different groups um, they were actually both doing their analysis at Berkeley at that, at that moment, um, but also um, with collaborators uh, all around the world, um, and uh, in including uh, 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 Professor Ruiz La Fuente here, um, who, is, who you can see in, the, in one of these pictures. Uh, she's right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, uh, so this was obviously a, a, a very much of a team sport um, with, uh, with uh, you know, all the countries um, involved uh, on both of these teams. Um, so it was a, it's, it's very much an international project. Now, this um, work, of course, is um, just setting the stage for what it is that all of us have been doing um, for the past, what, 20 years since. Um, and so what I'm struck by is that the, uh, the quality of the data um, is getting dramatically better. And, uh, oh, okay. and so if I turn this around and flip this upside down the way that we, the astronomers usually would plot it, um, you can see that from those first 50 supernova, um, we moved up to hundreds of supernova. And in fact, right at the moment, we're uh, just finishing the analysis of, uh, of over 1,200 supernova. And what's striking is that every single one of these uh, supernova, these 1,200 supernova, is measured much better with you know, much better statistics and, and, and systematic control than any of those first 50 supernova. So you, you know, obviously might think that, that's, uh, that this is going to give a much better, much better quality measurement, and it, it does. Um, but the problem is that the, the uh, difference between these, these theoretical constructs that we're after, of course, is, is so demanding that even this much, much better measurement really is only pinning down uh, tight error bars for, for example, properties like the equation of state, the springiness of the dark energy, it only gets pinned down at low redshifts, relatively nearby in time. And as soon as you get you know, a little further away, um, the properties of dark energy are very poorly constrained. And, and in fact, almost any theory, including theories that are not dark energy at all, um, would, would fit um, the, this huge, these huge error bars. So the job is clearly um, not completed yet. And uh, as I had mentioned this morning, um, I think that a lot of what we've been doing over the past uh, 20 years is getting ready for the generation of measurements that we're about to accomplish. So let me describe first a little bit how that's played out in the supernova, some of it's played out in the supernova world, and then a little bit about why um, I think that's very important to, to bring together with the other techniques um, that are now that are being used, including the techniques that are being developed um, here uh, in, uh, in Barcelona. 
Um, all right, so first, uh, as I was saying, what's so hard is just the fact that even with all the beautiful new data that's you know, improved this, this measurement uh, dramatically, um, the, that's still not good enough to differentiate between these theories, which are all um, agreeing within the thickness of this green line. So it's, uh, that's the sense in which it's a, a, a much more precision is needed. And once you start getting to that level of precision, it's clearly not just a statistics problem. Th now you're, you're needing to understand the systematic errors so well that even when your statistics gets that good, you will still trust it. Um, so let me make, uh, uh, describe this in a few different redshift ranges, um, since the problems are slightly different and what you're trying to accomplish is slightly different in these, in these different ranges. First, let me um, go to this region out here at the very highest redshift, um, where right now this data is actually rather sparse. And that's one of the reasons that we have less good constraints on the time variability of, of dark energy. And uh, not only is it sparse, but these error bars are, are, are not as good as the error bars um, down here. And so one of the jobs we've uh, taken on is asking what can we do to improve that regime um, during this, this period. Um, here it is actually a statistical problem um, first. The systematics are not yet, uh, I don't think, the, the limiting factor. And um, we need to be using the, um, the space-based instrumentation to, to do this, this kind of work in, the, in this highest redshift range. Um, there's two major projects that, I'm, that I've, my group's been involved with, with several other groups around the world, um, in this range, redshift range. One of them is a project uh, using, which I, which I won't discuss as much today, um, which is using the new wide field uh, instrument on the Subaru telescope um, in Hawaii. And uh, that's allowed us to find supernova, and then we're following them with the Hubble Space Telescope in, a, uh, in one of the more traditional ways of using the Hubble Space Telescope. The other one that I, I, I would like to tell you about uh, a little bit more today is the, a technique that we started developing to, take a, um, to handle the fact that the Hubble Space Telescope has a very narrow field of view, and so it's not really well designed for um, looking for very rare events in, in big fields. And so what we ended up doing was uh, going back to an idea from uh, that was you know, probably back in the early 80s, um, which was the idea of using clusters of galaxies. And uh, in a cluster of galaxies, even the Hubble Space Telescope's narrow field of view can be looking at thousands of, um, uh, uh, well, hundreds at least, of, of galaxies at a time. And what we ended up doing is designing several programs where we would look at, oh, a dozen clusters and just keep revisiting them over and over and over again until, first of all, the uh, supernova would explode. <laughs> and second of all, um, that, that series of observations would allow us to build up a, a light curve of the supernova. And this technique, um, we did it in an earlier generation and it was re uh, a slightly lower redshift. And then uh, this current project called Sea Change um, is done at even a higher redshift range between redshifts 1.2 and 1.7. Um, and it's actually been quite successful at finding uh, supernovae. So we've by now found about 30, um, a little more than 30 supernovae um, in this way. And uh, just a blink between the uh, supernova on and the supernova off pictures. So to give you a sense for what this data looks like from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and these supernovae, uh, some of these clusters are so productive that if you just keep watching them over and over, you get multiple supernovae. So we now have uh, you know, one cluster where we have, uh, I think, four, uh, you know, four supernovae um, from, this, uh, from this one uh, cluster and several others that have three supernovae in them. So uh, a, a, a challenge for the, for the listener <laughs> is we're trying to think, is there anything fun you could do um, bec because you happen to know that you have all these, uh, a whole series of supernovae in the same cluster, um, which is kind of a fun question. Um, but for the purposes of the cosmology, of course, Wherever they are, it's, it's helpful in beating down the statistics on the measurement of the, uh, of the expansion of the universe. Um, and because you come back and visit over and over and over again um, on these same cluster, these fields, um, you end up getting beautiful light curves, you know, much nicer than, we've, than we, well, even much, much nicer than we had seen in the old days at you know, redshifts of 0.3. And now we're getting these amazing light curves at redshifts 1.5 and 1.7 and uh, one point, and, uh, and so you know, we, we're building up this kind of data set. Um, and so we're, uh, we now have, of those 30-some-odd 30, 30 
uh, supernova that we discovered, 25 of them have very nice light curves and we have evidence for what their redshift is. And so we're about to put 25 new supernova onto this um, range of the, of the Hubble diagram. Um, but one thing that we consider to be very important in doing this kind of work, um, which I, we've been uh, pushing very hard, and I think um, a lot of the uh, cosmology community is now adopting, is that we do these kinds of analysis um, with a blind analysis technique so that you want to make sure that you don't let yourself see the answer while you're testing all your software for bugs, while you're looking for um, problems in, in, your, in your scientific uh, uh, reduction techniques. Um, and I've come to think that this is very important. I'll come back to this again later um, because I think I've, I, we definitely see evidence that when people do not blind the analysis, they end up getting, um, you know, hunting for their mistakes up to the point they get a result that they expect and then they stop hunting for the mistakes and publish. And so I believe that you tend to get results that are looking like what you expect rather than that would show you any surprises in the world. So right now we're in the very final stages with this, uh, this new data set of 25 supernova. And all I can show you is where they will be on this Hubble diagram if it happens to be the case that they agree perfectly with the standard model that we have so far. But we don't know if this is wh where they will be. So this is what they would look like um, if they come in. As you can see, it's actually a very rich data set with error bars that are now getting competitive um, with the error bars at the lower redshift. And so we think that that is going to help us constrain this, um, this shift in the equation of state or the possibility of a shift in the equation of state over time. And, um, and just to give you a sense of the, the kind, of, uh, kind of urgency of these kinds of problems, um, I was, uh, I we were looking at where did that um, previous measurement from the, from the baryon acoustic oscillation at a uh, very high redshift show up and uh, when we were seeing tension. Now, today we think that the most recent results have lowered this tension and that's probably a statistical fluctuation. Um, but if you, uh, if you get results that are, you know, that are so far away from a standard lambda CDM as this, um, you need at least two methods to be able to trust them. And it seems to me that in the end of the day, it doesn't make any sense to make measurements um, that you would not trust if you got a surprise um, because then you'll only trust it if you get what you expect. And, uh, and obviously that's not science. So, um, so we're, quite, we're quite excited to see uh, what this new data set that sea change will look like. Will it turn out to be here or will it turn out to be somewhere surprising? Um, and, uh, and we're expecting that we should know actually within just now a matter of weeks or a month or so uh, that we'll be ready to unblind um, this data set. So stay tuned uh, on, on, on this one. Um, now, those uh, supernova that I was just describing, because, uh, because this population that I was showing you here is, uh, um, is so sparse, this result, um, I think, is still something where we're not yet systematics limited um, in, the, in the measurement errors. But um, all the rest of the redshift range, um, now the statistics are, are so good that the real question is how do we know that we're not just seeing some drift in the behavior of the supernova, the dust, uh, or uh, the, the ways in which you've controlled your, your photometry. Um, and so the real focus, I think, for a lot of these last 10, 15 years has been on asking, what can we do to take the supernova technique and make it trustworthy at these amazingly precise levels? Um, so this actually has been one of the things that we focused on using what we call the nearby supernova factory. This is another international collaboration, um, particularly with, a, uh, with French partners, um, using the 2.2-meter um, telescope at the uh, University of Hawaii. And the idea there is that uh, we designed and built a unusual pixelated spectrograph. So this is a, an integral field spectrograph where every pixel gets its own spectrum. And that means that you have data cubes every time you take an observation um, where you basically have an image and a, and a spectrum um, for that particular location in the sky. We designed this uh, to be always mounted on the telescope so it could be just switched over and pointed um, and we run it uh, well, essentially uh, remotely um, two to th uh, every two or three nights in the year 
and follow then the whole time series of spectra. The advantages of having this kind of spectral uh, cube um, in are particularly important for supernova because supernova spectra are easy to confuse with the spectrum of the galaxy that it's in, the host galaxy. So you need to have a way of subtracting out the host galaxy light. And if you have an image uh, for every, every wavelength in your spectrum, which is essentially what you're getting here, um, you can just use image subtraction techniques to remove the light um, that's coming from the, spectr the spectrum of the supernova, and you're left with just the spectrum of, uh, sorry, remove the light from the host galaxy, and you're left with just the light from the supernova. So that's um, given us these uh, time series of spectra, um, and, uh, and we've now run this for enough years that we've built up these time series of you know, over 300 supernova with 4,000 spectra on these supernova alone, and then many more spectra on other supernovae that we haven't followed as densely, uh, and other targets that we haven't followed as densely. And uh, we're now uh, getting to the point where we're mining this data set and working to make sure that it's every point and every spectrum is calibrated so well that you can treat the integral of uh, any wavelength range as if it were a photometry point, as if it were measured with a filter. And so you get to tune whatever filters you want you can just make up synthetically, and you can even place them at whatever redshift you want um, since you actually have the full spectrophotometric data set. So that's been the real aim and the goal of this work. This work is also now just concluding. We finished all the observations, and the final uh, steps of checking all of the nonlinearities and, uh, and, and all of the, um, the calibration uh, across wavelengths is, is now um, in its final months, and, we, we think, and we've already started getting interesting results coming out of it. So let me describe at least some of those results um, at, at, this, at this stage. First, I'll just uh, re remind you that as you watch a supernova evolve, if you're getting this dense a series of, of uh, spectra, um, you can see the features you know, appearing and, uh, and reaching peak brightness. And then some of the features uh, you know, start to fade away. Others um, stay uh, very high. And you're getting this uh, very complex time evolution of the spectrum of the supernova. So what does that time evolution represent? Well, if you think about it, the, oh, do this. Uh, so yeah, well, let me, which order I want to do this in. So, so we get these time ev evolution of, of the spectra, one after another. And uh, what that represents um, is something of a, of a CAT scan through the supernova because as the supernova explodes, the outer layers are opaque first, and you see those first. Um, they expand, they become transparent, and you see a little deeper in. Those layers expand, become transparent, you see deeper in. So if you're able to watch this entire time series of spectra, um, you're essentially uh, getting to do a scan of all of the material um, at every level in this ball of exploding gas. And, uh, and we see that as a, a very important tool um, to be able to compare one supernova to another, because it means it's very hard for a supernova to behave, um, uh, you know, to, to have some other physical process happening in it compared to another one if it matches perfectly throughout the whole bowl of gas. Now, um, what we've been uh, finding is that when you look through all the systematics um, of these supernova using these kinds of complete data sets, you can be comparing many, many different sources of uncertainty. So uh, one of the big ones is actually the um, photometric calibration um, of the, the photometry system that we are all using. So right now, there's uh, real concerns about the fact that we have very, uh, it's very hard for us to compare in absolute physical units um, how bright something is in the blue compared to how bright something is in the red. And for these kinds of measurements that I'm describing, that's crucial because you're going to be redshifting um, and you're going to then compare things to high redshift in one wavelength band to things at low redshift in that are in another wavelength band. And so you have to have that cross calibration right. Um, you'll see things like uh, Milky Way extinction may becomes important for that same reason, that you'll be looking through Milky Way um, in the parts of the, uh, of, of the wavelength re regions at high redshift um, where it actually trans comes through dust very easily, whereas at low, red at low redshifts, you're looking on the bluer side and it, it doesn't come through as easily. So you really have to have known your, uh, you have to know the Milky Way dust extinction story very well. Um, 
the local dust that's actually near the supernova has been a standing problem um, in the supernova community that we seem to be uh, seeing evidence of slightly different properties of that dust compared to what you might think of as average Milky Way dust. And if that's true, then you really have to worry about the possibility that there's a drift in the properties of the dust um, over time as you, look back in, as you look back in time. So um, these are all things that now we're using this very comprehensive data set to try to constrain um, better. But what's interesting is that when we've started comparing these effects to the effects of a population drift in the differences among the supernova spectra it themselves, the intrinsic spectral shapes, um, that's the one that's, uh, th these are actually all on the same scale. And so these are much steeper runouts um, and, and much uh, of much bigger concern um, for, a, a, um, uh, for a systematic error property um, than the ones that I, I, that I begin with, began with, which are the ones that most people usually think about when they discuss supernova um, systematics. So what we've been finding then is that you have to be watching very, very carefully to make sure that the differences among, the, um, among these supernova spectral time series aren't changing as you go out, uh, or the populations aren't changing as you go out to high redshift. And let me, and let me focus your uh, eye a little bit on a few of these just to give you a sense that they are different. Not every supernova um, of these type 1a supernova is the same. So for example, if you look at the, near this peak here, um, you can see that this supernova appearance is very different from this supernova appearance. And, uh, and both of them look different from this one over here. And those are big enough differences that they are, can become the dominant source of systematic uncertainty if you have a population of supernovae that are predominantly this kind at low redshift and then predominantly you know, this kind or this kind at high redshift. So that's why it's so important to be able to make sure that you're looking at the same objects at high redshift and low redshift. Now, um, what I haven't emphasized before was that these plots are not only showing you the differences among supernova, but they're also showing you that there are, in fact, matching supernova, ones that are actually very close to each other. And uh, in particular, each of these plots shows not just one supernova, but a pair of supernova that do match. So uh, here, there's a green time series and a black time series drawn on top of each other. I don't know whether you can tell that from beyond the first few rows, um, but they're such good matches that it's hard to tell. And so those two supernova really are um, apparently an entire ball of gas over this entire time series that is um, showing all the same behavior and those are the ones that you want to use um, to compare at high redshift and low redshift. Um, whereas, uh, so you don't want to compare these to these, but you do want to compare the black to the green or here there's a black you compare it to the red. Here there's a blue and a black one that are right on top of each other. And so we have what we call twin supernova, supernova that are behaving the same all the way through this expanding atmosphere. And, um, and so this, I think, is, the, is the, one of the crucial ingredients now that will allow us to use supernova at this level of precision that we haven't, been able to, we haven't tried before. To give you a sense of what difference that makes, if you have really well-matched twins, the dispersion between supernova is now down at the you know, 8% in magnitude, which is 4% in, in brightness um, level, whereas um, it's a, at least double that if you um, look at things that are, are not twins, like you know, the green compared to the blue, red one I showed you on the previous graph. So, uh, so, so this is, a, I, I think, a, a relatively important effect. Now, statistically, it's helpful um, because if you use something that tight, has tighter dispersion, um, then you can use, you know, if it's twice as good dispersion, you can use four times fewer um, supernova to make the same measurement, or you get, you know, twice as, as strong a measurement with, with, with the same number. But what's more important, I think, than the statistics is the systematics, the fact that um, this is one of the only ways we know to ensure that the supernova population isn't drifting on us as you go out to high redshift. Um, now, one of the places that this has become a... Uh, we, we recognize that there is a, something that has to be watched for this kind of drift, um, came out from these studies of how the supernova residual on the Hubble diagram um, went as a function of the host galaxy's behavior. And for example, host galaxy mass was, um, was, is one that's seen as a, a very big indicator of the supernova brightness. Um, and there's no good reason, right? It's not that we expect um, a supernova can look and say, oh, I'm, I'm in a galaxy with this mass, I should turn my brightness up. Um, clearly, there's some population effect 
where we're getting a slightly different range of supernova in the very massive galaxies than we are in the uh, low mass galaxies. And you would like to see that that shows up in these twinning uh, differences. So that you want to know that if you're looking at true twins, that this step um, that's, uh, it's you know, a little hard to see in the here, but the step between low mass and, and high mass um, supernova brightnesses um, should go away if you are only comparing supernova that are, have all the same twin properties in their spectra. And uh, that is actually now something that we've an analyzed. Um, and uh, right now the, the, the training sample was tested and it looks like it's gone away. We're about to do the unblinding to see whether it, that's the case for the whole sample. Um, but already the indication is that if you use twinning, um, you do not see a step, whereas if you, uh, if you allow everything to be mixed together, um, you'll be looking at slightly different populations in low mass and high mass galaxies. So uh, this is very much the kind of, of control that we were hoping for. I should also mention that the work of my uh, grad st graduate student, um, Kyle Boone, um, on this twinning has been, uh, has been fun to watch because he's taken um, what was a multi-parameter uh, measurement to tell apart the different spectral types. So we had something like you know, 15 parameters um, for, a, for a, uh, a PCA analysis that, sh that covers all the variations of spectra. And he's done a, a bit of machine learning and manifold analysis um, to understand how many truly independent um, uh, components are there. And if you don't insist on the components being linearly additive the way a, a PCA analysis does, um, and you actually just follow where the components take, take you, it looks now as if we have four components that describes this huge variation of uh, type 1a supernova, which obviously is much more tractable, much easier to, to work with. And so this, uh, this paper is about to come out with a, a, a study of this um, dimensional reduction that will get us down to, we think, four components that would describe the difference among these different supernova. The next job, of course, is to go back to the theorists and see whether the theoretical studies of the supernova can capture those particular component uh, differences. And uh, it's, it's been the case you know, throughout the history of the supernova work that the theorists um, have lots of good explanations after the fact, um, but it's been rare that they've actually been able to predict something for us to go look at um, before the, beforehand. And so we're hoping that this time around, if we give them this strong a clue, it'll give them something uh, that they might be able to give us a, uh, a, a hand with um, and give us some hints for what to be looking for. Um, all right, so just make sure I don't run out of time so we keep moving here. Um, so you might ask, if we want to do these kinds of, of, of uh, twin analyses um, that I'm showing here, um, it does require very high quality spectrophotometry um, to be able to compare the supernova to each other. And uh, we obviously have been able to demonstrate that at low redshift where the supernova factory was working. This is at a redshift range between 0.2 and 0.8, uh, sorry, 0.02 and 0.08. Um, so these are all very low redshift supernova that are just far enough out so that they're mostly in the Hubble flow and that you're not just seeing peculiar velocities um, you know, messing up the, uh, the Hubble expansion. Um, but if you want to work uh, in the, to, to study the cosmology, then you need to go you know, much further out. And uh, you know, clearly, you're not going to, um, with current instruments, get these kinds of supernova measures um, that well with the spectroscopy. But what's striking is that even at much lower redshift uh, down here, the current data sets are not good enough to be able to recognize this twinning. Um, and, and it's partly because the instrumentation has not allowed us to subtract out the host galaxy light. Um, it's also people have not designed the instruments to be able to do spectrophotometric studies. So you get all sorts of tilts in the, uh, in the colors of the, of the spectra that come in and that you have to try to calibrate out. So th the challenge has been, can we do this kind of twinning um, even in the mid-redshift range where we might begin to start seeing these evolutionary drifts? I think that there are ways that we can now uh, pursue that. And I was going to mention one in particular that we've been spending a lot of time and effort working on. So if you start um, with something like the LSST uh, planned supernova program, um, it's almost entirely photometric. And, uh, and it, doesn't, uh, it has not taken into account um, techniques for even getting many spectra at all, let alone the kind of spectra that we need. 
So we've been looking at what would it take to combine that with a space program such as WFIRST. And we um, were able to show, and that this is actually work that came out of some things that uh, many people, uh, there may be people here in Barcelona who were involved with back in the early days when we were developing the previous generation of the same satellite, the SNAP satellite, um, where we were realizing that you can put in these wide field instruments um, a, a small uh, integral field unit spectrograph. And um, just using a small, and the, 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 that's the, uh, another one of these forms of these, um, these uh, pixelated uh, spectrographs. In this case, it's using image slicing technology. And with a s just a small shoebox size spectrograph added to this kind of uh, telescope, um, you're able to get spectra um, which are, very, are certainly good enough to be able to do the sorts of twin analysis um, that I was showing you. So we've now gone and we've designed these spectrographs. We've done the simulations of what the data sets would look like. And then we've actually asked the question of, for the resolution of these spectrographs, um, uh, you know, how well can we get this kind of twinning? And uh, it turns out that it's a function of the signal to noise. So you can just ask, how long do the measurements need to be? And for very reasonable exposure times on that class of, uh, these are 2.4 meter class telescopes um, that in space, um, you can actually uh, do the twinning um, well enough to be training down to the dispersion of about 0.09 uh, magnitudes, as I was showing you with the twinning. So um, that's you know, a very encouraging, because it means that, in principle, we can go and do that for a big sample of LFST, mid-range supernova. Uh, but not only that, but we can even do it for the high redshift supernova that I was just showing you that you can only measure from space, that you can even get this quality of, of, uh, of measurement for, for those as well. So that's the good news. Now, um, let's see what. Yeah, so, so the, the uh, unfortunately, the, the bad news um, is that the politics of doing any large project in space um, are such that every time you think that you've just um, gotten uh, everything agreed to and, and, the, and the funding's all there and it's all gonna work, um, something goes wrong. And the most uh, recent thing that's gone wrong on this uh, work is that this is such a, um, a small, uh, standalone, inexpensive piece um, in, in, the, uh, in the whole system uh, that it was a natural, obvious one for a foreign partner to, uh, to take ownership of. And so uh, the, the Canadians said they wanted to build that piece. Um, and then last year, when the uh, President, uh, Tr President Trump's budget came out, um, it was, it, he uh, you know, does, does lots of things in that particular budget that Congress then proceeds to ignore. And in the United States, that's kind of known. And so uh, people don't take it too seriously that Trump's budget canceled the entire space uh, project, this entire W first project. But uh, nobody thought that that was actually going to make any difference, except the Canadians, um, who had their budget uh, released the following week. And so they, it was just too embarrassing for them to have a huge, big splash about their budget item, um, paying for this new instrument on this great telescope that just the week before was in the news being canceled. Um, so, so it ended up not being in the Canadian budget. And, uh, and then, of course, just three weeks later, um, Congress uh, you know, passed their bills and said, um, okay, we're ignoring that. Um, w first is, is fine, it's still going ahead. But by then, Canada didn't have it in the budget. It would take another whole year for it to get back into a Canadian budget. And NASA says, oh, too late. Um, we, we have to keep moving. Um, and so, so I've been spending some time trying to figure out what can we do to recover um, these capabilities. And uh, so we, we, I'm, I'm at the moment, I'm, it's very unclear whether we'll, uh, what, what's going to happen with this. It may be that we'll have to actually go to the next, uh, to the next uh, mid -ex, um, explorer mission uh, concept time and see whether we can just get a standalone spectrograph on a small explorer that, goes, that flies separately you know, uh, along with it. Now, you know, maybe we get to do other things like you know, follow uh, gravitational wave events um, or something as well. But uh, I, I think you have to be very Zen uh, Buddhist to do space missions um, <laughs> because you have to just take these, you know, these ups and downs. Uh, you know, at we've, this is probably about the seventh or eighth time that we've either you know, been successful, everything is going to work fine, or everything was over and, and not working. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But 
I, I brought this up actually for another reason, because I, I think it's really important to ask what kinds of projects, and, and this is my, the, the main thing I want to finish with, which is what kinds of projects um, is it worth doing uh, when, you're, when you're doing this, these very ambitious next generation um, experiments? And uh, of course, for this particular measurement, um, we don't have that many different techniques to use. You know, we have uh, this supernova technique. Um, move back where we were before. We have the supernova technique, of course, which uses a standard candle measurement um, from local uh, supernova and goes out, goes back in time uh, to go to using comparing it to more and more distant supernova. We have the uh, BAO, the Vulcan uh, acoustic oscillation technique, that takes um, the the hot and cold spots in the nearby unis universe and goes forward in time. Um, in fact, let me just, uh, yeah, and then, and then we have uh, you know, perhaps weak lensing and maybe cluster counting as our other techniques. So there aren't that many techniques in play. And so when you're trying to do make a very difficult measurement, um, you really need all of those techniques to stand on their own two feet um, because you're going to need to trust each one of them to compare against the others. They can't all just lean you know, about, well, this is a poor measurement, and this is a poor measurement, but maybe the two poor measurements makes a good measurement. You know, that, won't, that won't work. Um, so just to remind, uh, once more, let me step back just for those people who are, uh, are, you know, might be joining us um, who, are, who are not involved in cosmology and just explain one of the other techniques in um, just a little bit more detail. Um, this is the baryon acoustic oscillation technique. It's called BAO. And the, uh, the basic idea is that the satellite projects that are looking at the, co the glow um, left over in, uh, from the cosmic microwave background um, shows us the patterns of slightly hotter and slightly um, colder spots on the sky. Those represent slightly more dense and slightly less dense in the early primordial soup of the universe before things separated enough to start becoming galaxies and stars. But the places where there's more, there is uh, more density um, is where the galaxies and stars would preferentially form. So if you can look at the typical scale of, uh, of distances between the hot and the cold spots um, at that early time, that is what you then track to later time as a standard ruler to the typical distances between where the galaxies um, and clusterings of, of, of uh, structure occur in later universe. And that's the essence of how you can go from a, uh, a structure scale in the past to more recent times um, using the Baryon acoustic oscillation. And it's been very uh, successful. There are uh, people here in, in, the, in the room who've been involved in these uh, projects, uh, the BOSS project and the current eBOSS project, um, that have been uh, remarkably uh, giving these remarkable po data points um, at redshifts like 0 0.57, 0 0.23, um, showing these kinds of features. And, uh, and now we're on from the current generations, um, which include eBOSS, where you uh, look at every galaxy by plugging a fiber into a plug plate by hand to about to be using the next generation where a robotic positioner um, allows you to look at thousands um, uh, every, every time you, you move the, the telescope of these galaxies. So we're, uh, we're actually very much looking forward to this next generation um, where the data points from instead of being just a few of these points that we have so far from, um, uh, uh, from the Byron acoustic oscillation compared to the supernova um, will be these amazingly tiny points that we're expecting from this project called DESI with the robotic positioner. Um, all right, so that's the, that's the end of my little side digression for, for those who aren't already working in that, in that field um, uh, that are here. And, this, and these, this series, I think, is, is one of the things that Barcelona has, has been involved with as well. So I, you may have been hearing these talks um, in from others as, uh, also. Um, so with, uh, okay, let me just go back for one second, back to here again. So, um, so that was a sense in which supernova go forward, uh, I'm sorry, go, go backward in time from re recent uh, examples um, where you know their brightness. And Baryon acoustic oscillation takes you forward in time from the early primordial structure to what the structure looks like today. But they overlap each other. And uh, those are the two techniques we have, which will tell us about the scale of the universe as a function of time. And they better both be working well for us to be able to compare them. It's not good enough um, if one's 
good and the other one's not because if you see any surprises, you won't know what to make of it. Um, and so that's why I'm, I'm uh, arguing that it's so important for each one to be capable of doing, doing a measurement. Similarly, um, techniques like weak lensing and cluster um, will also have to be uh, able to be cross-checked very, very well. However, they bring in an extra complication of um, the uh, basically studying what gravity is doing over time to structure in the universe. And so they will ask other questions, and we need to have the supernova and baryon oscillation stand on together um, to ask the questions about scale. Um, so that being the case, it's interesting to look at what's the expected uncertainty that we'll get um, in the distance scale from the upcoming generation of, of baryon acoustic oscillation measurements and then compare it to the supernova measurements. And uh, th these are projections that are expected for uh, the techniques like DESI and, and W-FIRST and the Euclid uh, space uh, instrument. Um, this is what BOSS was doing. And for comparison, in the overlap region here with supernova, um, they are both very competitive with each other if you're able to control the systematics using the techniques that I was describing. And so I, that's the reason I, I was seeing this as such an important thing to fight for and why we should keep working on it. And in general, as we design these kinds of projects in the future, that's the kind of comparison I think you want to be doing. You want to be checking that the two different techniques will both be competitively um, accurate so that there's a chance that if you see something surprising, um, you'll, you'll be able to trust it. And, uh, and in fact, I've been trying to point out that something like WFIRST, um, that's really you know, almost a, a key philosophical point um, that, that, that actually that, that it works that way. You, there's really no point, it seems to me, in flying a multi-billion dollar mission um, that would only be believed if it finds your expected result. Um, so if, it, if, if, you, uh, if anything else, you would look at it and say, well, I, I bet there's something wrong, um, and I don't have any way to tell, um, then it's almost not worth doing the project because all you can find is things that you, that you expected. It's, you know, it's sort of the def definition of confirmation bias. Um, all right, so I wanted to uh, make sure I stopped early enough for, for any discussion and, and questions. So let, that's a, seems like a good philosophical point to leave you on. And so let me, let me pause there and just reiterate what I, one of the things I had said this morning in the earlier uh, conference, which was um, it's been such a long haul um, between the time of the discovery of the dark energy to now to build all of those instruments and develop these different techniques, um, BA BAO, weak lensing, and this next generation of supernova. Um, and um, in some sense, everybody should feel very energized because like, we're just about to enter that period in which this new um, set of data will come in. And I think that there's a pretty good chance that we'll see some surprises. You, um, at the time when we saw the first result and we started doing these step-by-step improvements of the, of the measurements, I remember saying to somebody at that point that, you know, these steps are going to be really hard because they will over and over again show the same result that we had before because none of them are good enough to show any, any big difference. And so people are going to start assuming that we must know the answer. It must be, you know, the simplest uh, maybe cosmological constant answer um, just because none of them are powerful enough to show anything different than that. And, um, and, it's, and everybody will have to keep describing what they're doing as a big success. So it'll be hard for people to be patient and, and recognize the fact that all these big successes are going to almost guaranteed show us just that we live in a, a universe that's likely to be very similar to a cosmological constant universe. And it's now finally um, this next generation, I think, of, of experiments that we're about to start are the ones that have the first chance of showing us something different and I'm hoping people you know, stick to their degree of skepticism that we know the answers long enough so we get a chance to see if there's a surprise. Um, and, I'm, and I would think that it's likely. I mean, you don't do a whole new level of precision very often. And in cosmology, every time we've done it, we found surprises. And, uh, and I think that we have not yet reached the point where we know that we're in a mature field where each new measurement just confirms what you've seen before. Um, and so, uh, so um, until that happens, I, I think that's, that's probably the way to bet. All right, let me, let me stop there and see, see if there's some questions. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. I was mm, really 
uh, surprised by many of the developments that I didn't know about uh, the twinning of supernova and these things that are in the web, but sometimes w one doesn't read. And I would like to invite also the people that work in bioacoustic oscillations in the observational part. And I have a question for them, whether they do uh, actually blind analysis of, of the data when they, for instance, measure the bow scale through the line and alpha forest, when they do these things. You, you, you? <laughs> I, I, and I was going to say that I think that um, there's a very interesting discussion. I, I don't know whether Euclid's having this discussion, but W first, there's a very strong desire to um, have all of the data become immediately available to everybody um, all at the same time um, early on. And it's striking me that uh, I think that as a community, we have to think very hard about how do we want to do staged releases of data so that everybody can go through the exercise of blind analysis together um, and, and, uh, and see what the results are because there is, there's only one universe out there and if especially for things like uh, BAO and uh, you know, where once you've observed the whole sky, you've observed the whole sky. And so you will never be able to ask a question again that requires fresh statistics um, if, if you've already unblinded everything at the very beginning. Yes, so the discussions are going on and it's still not decided whether it should there should be different steps in blinding for the first year and the second year, third year, fifth year, or if we blind from the beginning using uh, this two-step technique. But maybe I can explain it later. If, uh, yeah, I'll be, I'll be curious to hear. Yeah. Okay. You can explain it <laughs> if you want. <laughs> okay, so in short, it's... Um, it's uh, using two steps. First of all, mimicking, mimicking an alcock paczynski effect by having a different cosmology. And then the second step, step mimicking RS, uh, an RSD signal. And just by changing uh, the positions of galaxies along the line of sight. And that's basically it. So, so you, uh, you take actual existing galaxies and you move them to where they would be if there's a, a mimicked RSD effect or exactly. if there's a mimicked alcock paczynski Exactly. That's, that's good. Anybody wor working on clustering of galaxies? I think some people have found that they are very powerful in discriminating some dark energy models. I have a student of mine that says that the best thing to do for with LSST for discriminating some particular uh, alpha tractor models. Do you want to have a any any doing anyone doing th theory which implies um, bow acoustic oscillation? Or supernova? Mm. You want to comment on it? Uh, one thing I'll just mention on the on the weak lensing uh, 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 on the um, cluster count uh, story, that technique uh, that I've shown you of looking at clusters to find the supernova for sea change um, ends up also giving you very deep uh, images in the near infrared from W first, and so it allows us um, to well our partners to do weak lensing studies um, of those. Uh, clusters that actually have SZ measurements um, as well, with the idea being that you'll be able to do some calibration of the SZ masses. And of course, um, the whole problem with cluster counting is to figure out um, where your mass cutoff is, since it's a very steep uh, function of the, of the mass cutoff, that if you get your mass cutoff wrong, your cluster count uh, measurements are, are you know, much weaker. So we're hoping that we'll be able to do a tighter um, uh, calibration of the the masses of these uh, clusters, and that that will help us with the cluster count technique. I have plenty of questions for Sol, but uh, Hi. So uh, I have a question about how, um, if possible, this swing would be uh, would be possible to apply it <coughs> to the very very uh, close by supernovae, as one for example that are observed by the SUS project, because. Uh, 
I heard some concern about this uh, two population thing yes. that uh, whether they, r they they I think they now using the the mass step, but some people they're yep. saying that they should be using the eight step and this is basically a thing of modeling and if this could be used or is just a matter of that there are not enough, not enough numbers. No, I no I think that it's actually something that's very important to use for the Hubble for the uh, Hubble constant uh, story. Um, see if I can go back fast enough. Um, one of the uh, differences that one of the, the results from our uh, Supernova Factory work. Um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, was that along with the mass step um, as one of the ways of, of seeing the difference between the um, uh, the different populations of supernova? Um, it looks like it perhaps even stronger way of doing that is to look at the local star formation rate, and that that's actually even a better predictor than the mass of it. And so in principle, these are just measurements that should all be used if you're doing something as critical as the Hubble constant. Um, and right now, it's being inferred in a very weak way um, just as, as a population. And we believe that's one of the reasons why I'm, uh, I'm concerned about the uh, systematics for the Hubble uh, constant, that we used a different set of mass uh, hosts for the um, low redshift calibrator compared to the one that where the Hubble constant was measured. So no, I, I absolutely think that that's something that um, we can do and we should do, and it's just a matter of um, setting up the observing techniques and being ready as nearby supernova explode so that we definitely, uh, uh, every one of the future ones is observed this way. And is there a way to measure this age, st this age of the whole mass in a kind of um, cheapest way? Because uh, uh, the, the problem is that, uh, as far as you know, you need the uh, age alpha observations, and that's kind of expensive for the... Yeah, no, th th you c there are some colors that are, that are uh, from photometry that are not that bad. Um, as an indicator, and it's you, you, they can use some space observations as well, but, um, but that's, it, it is possible. Um, so that's one of the things that, that we're looking at right now. The other thing I should mention is that um, at the low redshift end, um, along with the Hubble constant, the other question that's coming up is can we uh, get um, structure, a uh, logical structure, at low redshifts where DESI would not be, you know, have enough modes to work? And so using peculiar velocity studies uh, with supernova instead of with galaxies, looks like it's actually a rather fertile uh, route to go if you can get the kind of calibration that we're talking about with the twinning technique. So that's another whole study that's being done now um, both uh, at, at with several of our collaborators. Perfect, thank you. I was mm, thinking of, of, the, of the question of the drift, of population drift, yes. that came so many years ago again and people suggested that maybe it was related with the fact that the younger galaxies have more massive progenitors, so they, they also have more dust. They have both things, that more dust and also more massive progenitors. So they make also ma more massive white dwarfs. Yes. And do you think it's possible to separate these two effects into the population drift? I, I think that the, the, the degree of separation that we're getting um, of different populations of supernova by using this um, detailed spectroscopy is, is, is actually very strong. Um, so I, I'm at this point, uh, we have not yet seen examples that make us think that we're m mixing things up still, um, if you are able to use that spectroscopy to separate. And the whole analysis points to any direction of what can be the theoretical cause or not yet. Oh, oh, you mean for the, uh, the for the for the what's okay. causing the steps yeah. and things like that? Not yet, not yet. Be I mean, mostly because the theory of supernova explosions, I, as, as you know, um, is, is still still isn't at the point where that level of detail of spectroscopy is, you know, the differences between the supernova wouldn't show up in a, in any of the current codes. People working modified gravity. General relativity. Uh, any questions, or uh, you have preferred to talk to Sol more privately? <laughs> any other questions around this? Well, if you if you want, we can move either to uh, the common uh, ICC room, or maybe we stay here and you have the the possibility to approach Sol and ask your questions 
individually. Thank you very much. Thank you. Which the uh, the trim? It sure looks like it. Actually, if you can get that, if you get the stretch back onto the stretch, it actually goes right there.